The year is 2001. The place is New York City. George Bush is president, and a subculture of young adults living off their overly supportive parents have just earned the moniker hipsters. Our story begins here, in Manhattan's East Village, at a small club called Plant Bar. Inside, you'll find James Murphy, a 32-year-old musician, DJ, and sound engineer who believes his chance of success has already faded from view. Little does he know he will go on to form LCD Sound System, one of the most popular and loved bands of the decade. We'll get back to that. He is currently working with British music programmer Tim Goldsworthy on the song you are hearing right now, House of Jealous Lovers by The Rapture. And this wallflower right here is Jonathan Galkin, whom you might recognize from the Nickelodeon show, Hey Dude. Hey Dude. Together, all three will go on to form the somewhat renowned independent music label, DFA Records. Here are some of the artists on DFA. The Rapture. Sin Kane. Yacht. I'm Juan McLean. Holy Ghost. Peter Gordon. Shit Robot. Prince on Dance School. I'm Nancy, and I played in LCD Sound System. LCD Sound System. LCD Sound System. Gavin Russom has been in four DFA bands and has built instruments for many of them. This is the system that I designed for James and for LCD Sound System. His creative and musical partner is Viva Ruiz. Together they are... The, the Crystal, Crystal Arc. Arc. This is Emma Jean and Charles. They met while interning at DFA. This is Hisham from Black Dice. I created the glasses that John Galkin wears. And I like them. DFA is a, is, is a family. Dysfunctional is a good word to use. I would say a dysfunctional family. Maybe John Galkin is the mom. Yeah. The mother. The Jewish mother, actually. Maybe I'm just like a, like a cow, and I have udders. And on each teat is a, is a different band. It's not a terrible analogy. Where do we place James in all of this? James is the father that I've never met. James is definitely like the traveling salesman sort of dad. Nobody ever knows where James is exactly. Paris. Paris. London. I think he's on a cruise ship to Jamaica. Test. We do this. Test to make the sink problem later. I know what you mean. Can you see the microphone? How about now? Well, DFA is a bunch of things to me. DFA can stand for disco for assholes. Don't fuck around. Dumb fucking assholes. Department of Funny Americans. Dumb fucking acronym. DFA was the name I, that I had. It was Death From Above. It was my nickname for mixing live audio because I was really, really loud. And then I met Tim Goldsworthy and we made a production duo together and called it Death From Above. And we started throwing parties. And so DFA for me was like this production duo and it was like the group of friends that were throwing parties. Like a collective of people that did stuff. And then we made a label like out of like from that. Since 2001, DFA has released 141 12-inch singles, 34 albums, six compilations, and the entire global operations of DFA is currently run by two people, John and Chris. I'm Chris Peterson. I think I'm the assistant label manager here at DFA. My responsibilities here, it's sort of a choose your own adventure sort of thing. We've kept the label small for, um, for, I mean, there's financial reasons. 
It took about two years to get paid here, although I did sleep in the office for the last six months of that, so I guess it was sort of a balance. This is Jonathan Galkin's ear. It is the filter through which all new DFA artists are found. Uh, John's taste of music is literally the most important thing to this label. Oh. Peanut butter is the greatest American flavor. It's the only flavor that the rest of the world, they don't get it. Peanut butter is in peanuts. Amazing. A uh, typical day in John Galkin's life, I imagine. He wakes up feeds like the eight or nine children that he has. He like pulls off all of the like thousands of children that he has. I believe he has three kids. Goes to work at the DFA offices. Gets on the phone about stuff. And then, and then after that, then I don't know, what, what does Gal can do? I have no idea, no one knows what he does. I am the head of business affairs. I am the head of um, the legal department here, product management, artist development, marketing, um, head of radio. It must be an insurmountable amount of work, probably. And yet, I feel like John handles it with grace. I do that probably 10 times a day. I kind of want to do that. That's something I would do. Would you do that? This is the DFA studio. I mean, for an indie label to have its own studio, this complex in the same building is kind of rare, I think. At DFA, the music is made downstairs, while the offices are upstairs. People definitely think DFA has a sound. Didn't it get lumped in as disco punk for a while? DFA sound. <laughs> Live drums and synthesizers. Dry drums in a small room. We have a little trick. I'm going to divulge to you here. So we use mouse pads and tape it to the drums. All the kicks are kind of like <laughs> The fundamental element of the DFA sound is certainly the way the uh, kick drum works, which tends to be a uh, steady uh, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. The audience, I want to describe the audience. European vinyl nerds. A lot of really dorky white people. Yeah, I think I'm our biggest fan. If somebody walks into this office, I'm just listening to DFA music over and over and over again. It's, it's the best. We have some really loyal fans. My friend and I actually made these scrub caps. I maybe have six or seven of them. What do people look like when they dance to DFA? A lot of this action and maybe some, like, maybe some... Waving their arms about, pogoing and flailing and sweating. Throughout the 90s, dance music was not something that was accepted in any way in the indie rock world. When I was making music all those times in the 90s, no one was ever like, is this fun? You know, it wasn't even important. It's kind of, it was just really revolutionary. Like, let's have this music that has to do with having a good time. I have seen like little blips and blops of Hey Dude. Have you seen the, the art that the person did of John and sent in? You haven't seen the cartoon, the crayon drawings that his super fan, male super fan, did of him shirtless playing a timpani drum? It is incredible. If you had to choose one LCD song, which LCD sound system song? I mean, that's a that's a tough question. Man, that's rough. Really like Dance Yourself Clean. Dance Yourself Clean. Great release. Your City's a Sucker. I was going to say that too. Your City's a Sucker. I think it's Losing My Edge. I'm going to bet people said Losing My Edge. Yeah, I'm Losing My Edge. I mean, Losing My Edge is one of the most clever songs ever written. Like, it's really a mission statement for the whole label. The kids are coming up from behind. My favorite lyric from Losing My Edge. I was there. I was there. But I was there. After years and years of being very neurotic and worrying about saying the wrong thing and hurting people's feelings and stuff, I had found a time where I was like, I was able to be pretty crazy, and it was OK. Is this a cry for help, or is this the next great single? And uh, it was both. <laughs> I hear Everyone you know is more relevant than everyone I know. The success of LCD really hinged on that track. 
it opened a lot of doors for everyone else at the label. At first, the label grew out of a group of friends. Now the label invites new people in, and they, you know, they become friends. And John now finds most everything. I see James a lot less since LCD continued year by year to increase in size, take up more of his time, where before we were sort of splitting the responsibility. I took it all over almost 100%. For years and years and years, he sat right there. I would turn 180 and there was James. In 2010 came around, people started to summarize the decade and there was a lot of DFA singles that were included in that and uh, a lot of albums that were included in that. It made a lot of us here just like forget, like you're like, oh, we meant something to like, a, like it definitely left a mark along the way. 12 is an important year in, in the life of a human being. It's the very end of your childhood. It's the beginning of your adolescence. There's something to be said for that. Perhaps there will be an awkward transitional period in DFA's output from now on. I'm just grateful that they actually like still exist. There's times when I think like, oh, maybe they'll just like stop. But I think we have years of embarrassing ourselves by trying to be current ahead of us, hopefully. If I'm gonna keep making music, I only wanna do it with DFA. For me, if there were no DFA, like I wouldn't continue as the Juan McLean. I mean, it's cute and we have it on a lot of coffee mugs and stuff like that and slip mats. Um, but I do think it's sort of true. Like, too old to be new, too new to be classic. Too old to be new, too new to be classic. I don't even know who coined those phrases. James tried to get that to catch on. I had to fight for that. People were not into it. Too new. Too new to be old. Too old to be new. Too, too new to be classic. Too old to be new. Too new to be classic. I got it now. Oh, well, now I get it. How oh, clever. Cute. By the way, that's the way, the modern way that you finish things nowadays. All right, cool, man. <laughs> it sucks, but I do it all the time. I'll say that all the time. All right, all right. Cool, man, cool.